Anyone here have troubles asking for help? Kind of hard to ask for help? So one, uh, three hands, all right. We're getting better at being vulnerable, guys. It's a good start to the year. This is one day I had to go to an event downtown. And I didn't want to spend a ton on parking. So I went looking for, you know, a parking spot farther away than where the venue was. Because I wanted to save some money. And so I'm driving around looking on a side street where you could maybe park for a couple hours and, you know, not have to pay too much. <clears throat> I found a spot after a while. The kicker was I'd have to parallel park into one of those really, really small spots. Now, I had a, a two-door car at the time, and so I believed I could do it. And so I started trying to parallel park. But time was running out. I was already running late. If you know me, I don't like to show up, like, really early. And this is a tension in my marriage. Lindsay likes to be, like, early or, like, yeah, early. Not, on time for her is early. <laughs> <laughs> like five minutes early, not crazy early, okay? <laughs> but um, I prefer to show up like right on the dot. A couple minutes after, it's fine. Uh, and so, you know, I'm feeling the, the pressure there on the time to park. And it's taking more time than I anticipated and budgeted for in my plans. And so I'm trying to parallel park here in this really small spot. spot but I, almo- I also kind of lack the experience to park efficiently. And I wasn't parking close by, so I knew I had all these thoughts in my mind, like, it's going to take me long, I'm going to be late, I'm going to have to run, how am I going to do this? And so I did what any person without a semblance of pride would do. I tried to fit my car into that spot over and over again. Tried once, then twice, and three times, and starting to feel a little bit embarrassed, but if people are staring at me, walking by as I'm trying to do this. <clears throat> and then the thought that I had been suppressing pushed its way through and demanded that I listen to it. Ask for help. If you're going to park here, you're going to need help, Alex. Ask a stranger walking by to help you. And I was like, oh, that's so awkward. Like rolling down the window, asking a random person for help. What if they laugh at me? What if they say no? The pain of being there in this kind of half in, half out spot half on the road, half just like feeling like, oh, I'm going to be late, pushed me to finally ask for help from a stranger. Excuse me, could you help me? Could you guide me in? And the person says to me, sure, I can help you. So a minute later, I had squeezed into the slightest of margins between me and the car in front of me and behind, and I thanked this person, and I I just kept going, and I went to my event. And you know, in life, we often will face challenges, really small ones, really simple ones, other times significant and large. And we often need to ask for help outside of us. And we're prone, though, to wanting to figure it out on our own, to trying to figure it out, to do it on our own, because we think we can. And it isn't until we're desperate and we're feeling pressed that we finally humble ourselves and ask someone else for help. And it doesn't have to be this way. In the passage that we're going to look at today, Jesus calls us to live differently. He wants his people to live in a way where they talk to their Heavenly Father about their needs and desires because he actually delights in giving them good gifts. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7 Verses 7 through 11. And this is part of the Sermon on the Mount that we've been going through now for a good while. And this is what Jesus says. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For whoever asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Father in heaven, we come before you today, and we ask that you would speak to us about your heart, about your desire for our lives. We ask that you'd give us ears to hear from you through your Son and that you would give us the power to respond in faith. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus gives us a command. Ask, seek, knock. And it's really easy when you first read this passage to misunderstand it. It's easy to read it one way and actually misunderstand what he's trying to teach us here. So what is he saying? Why don't we start with what he's not saying? He isn't saying, if we keep on asking, if we keep on seeking, if we keep on knocking, God will hear us. As if God is too tired or too busy or worse, uninterested in responding to us. That's not what he's saying, that you have to be persistent. This isn't saying if you labor in strenuous and repetitive prayer, you'll be heard. In fact, this is far less about what you do and far more about who you're talking to. Jesus is saying you have a heavenly Father who loves to hear from you. And he loves to give good gifts. He loves to show up. So talk to him. Ask him. Pray to your heavenly Father. He's not saying persistence is key. It's not about persistence. Bang on the door until you get answers. That's not what he's actually saying. He's saying, look who you're talking to. Your Father in heaven. He knows what you need before you do. In fact, Jesus has said that line a few times leading up to this passage in the Sermon on the Mount. He knows what you need before you do. He knows your thoughts before you're even able to articulate them. He hears you and he is good. So ask, seek, knock. See, Jesus isn't interested in creating a people who are completely independent of him and never ask for anything. That doesn't make him smile. He's not trying to form a people who never think about asking God for help. That doesn't glorify him. See, Genesis 3 was a mark, a moment that marked out humanity's refusing to live in reference to God, in dependence on God, and in relationship with God. And Jesus has come to restore the created order. He's come to restore us to our original relationship with God. He's creating a new humanity that lives dependent on the goodness and the wisdom of God the Father. He's forming a people who regularly and repeatedly ask God to give them what they need, to seek Him for provision, direction, wisdom, to knock on His door. The goal is for you, then, to talk to your Heavenly Father. And what He said here is astounding, because the command He gives us is really simple, breathtakingly simple. It's almost as if Jesus is begging us to pray six times in these four verses. Ask, it'll be given. Seek, you'll find. A knock, the door will be opened. You don't give your child a stone when they ask for bread. You don't give your child a snake when they ask for fish. Your Father in heaven is able to give good gifts to those who ask him, greater than you could possibly give to your own children. See, this is a call to prayer with expectation. One day I came home and Lindsay had saved me a bowl of chips. In our family, chips are like precious. Okay. And she had saved me a bowl. She had given the kids their own bowls. Evan had eaten his already, and he wanted to have mine, but he had already had his. And at the dinner table in front of everyone, Evan made known his desires. Daddy, can I have a chip? I raised my eyebrows at him. Mm, no, you've already had your chips. Please, Daddy, can I just have a little bit? Sorry, buddy, these ones are for me. Just a little bit? <laughs> no. There's silence for a little bit. Please, Daddy, just have a little crumb. <laughs> and when he said that, our whole table just burst out in laughter. And I was like, how could I keep saying no to you? To my clever little guy. Can I have a chip? Just a little bit? Just a crumb? He just, like, he just whittled me down, brought me to my knees, and I was like, yeah, of course, you can have a chip. See, we can learn from kids like Evan. He kept asking with confidence, and he didn't give up because I said no. He had the confidence that he could have chips. And in the end, Evan did get chips. See, God doesn't get annoyed by our requests. 
And he doesn't have to be convinced with clever words. He delights in being our provider. He delights in giving you what you need. It gives him great joy to give you chips. It doesn't bother him when we ask. And see, here's why we need to know this. Our problem is that we carry a heavy burden of wishes, desires, and needs that never become requests. They never become requests. We don't talk to our Heavenly Father about those things. We don't ask. We don't make our requests known. We talk to ourselves. We talk to other people about all of our problems. We'll talk to ourselves about our struggles in the form of worry and thoughts, in the form of sleepless nights and restless days. Meanwhile, Jesus is offering us, no, he's promised us an audience with the Father. More than just an attentive audience, he's actually offered us a fruitful audience with God the Father. So why don't we talk to him? Why don't we talk to him? We, we, I'm sure many of us have heard this command, ask, seek, knock. Why don't we? Well, let me just offer four reasons why we don't. Reason number one, we believe prayer should be about praising God, not asking for ourselves. It's selfish to ask for ourselves. If I'm going to pray, it should be about praising him. Reason number two, we believe prayer should be for others, not ourselves. Again, praying for myself is selfish. So I'm just going to pray for others. There's lots of needs other people have. My needs aren't that big, so I'm not going to ask. Reason number three, we believe prayer should be about giving thanks. Asking is selfish. These three reasons right now fund speak to a fundamental misunderstanding of what prayer is, though. Because prayer is a conversation between you and your Heavenly Father, one that includes praise, that includes intercession or asking for others, it includes thanksgiving, and it includes asking. Asking is completely appropriate in your relationship with God the Father. It's something that should happen. Reason number four, why we don't ask, is we believe asking annoys God. God's not interested in my problems. He's got bigger fish to fry in the world than what I have going on in my life. So I've got to figure it out myself. This belief re reveals that deep down there's this twisted and unhealthy understanding of who God is. You aren't relating to God as you should if you hold to this belief. You think he doesn't care and he's not personally involved and invested in your life and your needs. And Jesus wants to heal you of that understanding of your heavenly father because he wants you to know the father like he does. And maybe it's because we're Canadian, maybe it's because we're people, we, uh, we struggle with people pleasing or our own past experiences, whatever the reason might be that you worry about, you know, annoying your friends when you ask, when you need to ask for help. Or sometimes we feel that annoyance when someone asks us for help. Like it just feels deeply inappropriate. How dare you impose your requests on me? Like you should have just known that that would have been a huge intrusion on my time. Some of us think that way, and then we carry that way of thinking towards how we approach God. Oh, I'm not going to ask God for that. That'd be so, he's going to be so annoyed. See, every time you come to your Heavenly Father with requests, He is not annoyed. He is delighted. Every time you come to God the Father with your needs, He loves you all the more. Your presence is a delight to Him, and your requests are welcome. And so he says, Jesus says to us, if you, which of you, if your kid asks for bread, we'll give him a stone. If they ask for a fish, we'll give, you'll give him a snake. Who would give them salt when they're asking for water? Who would turn on AC in the house when they say, when your kid tells you they feel cold? Who ignores their kid when they say they need help? That's not how we work, and your heavenly father is not like that either. So then he'll say, if you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? See, Jesus wants you to relate to God the way he does, as Father. And one of the great gifts that Jesus gives to his disciples is the privilege of speaking to his Father as if he is your Father. 
That's why when he teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, he says, Our Father. Our Father. And the reason we can do that is because as one of Jesus' disciples, you get adopted into God's family. He adopts you as his own. You're his child. You're not just a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You are an heir of the kingdom of heaven. You are his child. Your father can draw from resources in heaven and on earth to take care of you, to lead you and equip you. So ask, Jesus says. Now I know while saying all of this that some of you feel a tension, even with this command, because you're like, all right, like... This teaching seems to run awfully close to a prosperity teaching. You name it and you claim it. It seems to suggest that if you have faith, God will give it to you. And I've thought that too. But you have to keep the rest of Scripture in mind. Elsewhere, Jesus' brother James confronts disciples of Jesus in the book of James. He writes in chapter 4, verse 2, You do not have because you do not ask God. And then verse 3 says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, that's not a contradiction to what Jesus is teaching us here on the Sermon on the Mount. It's a fleshing out of what Jesus teaches here. Motives are important. Jesus is forming a people who prioritize the kingdom of God, being rightly related to God and others in their lives. And so throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he's teaching his people, what what should you value? What should you treasure? What are you going to pursue? What will you love? Notice here, though, that Jesus doesn't tell us what to ask for. He doesn't put any parameters around asking. He doesn't even put parameters around who can ask, who can seek, who can knock. Those who ask will receive, he says. Those isn't anyone, anything. I can ask anything? I think we need to ask a question when we come to this, which is, why would Jesus teach us to pray like this? Why would Jesus teach us to pray like this? And as far as I can tell, there's two reasons that are connected. The first reason is that his ultimate concern, more than anything else, is that you actually have the gift. Jesus' greatest concern isn't being misunderstood. Jesus' greatest concern isn't that uh, you misunderstand him and think uh, that you can just ask for anything and you're always going to get it. And it's not even that he, he's not even concerned about this prayer being misused, and turning this gift into an instrument for yourself. His ultimate concern is that you have the gift, and the gift is his Father, is that you would have this relationship with God where you could come to him and make anything known to him. And see, when you come to God and you ask him to provide for you, you start to, and you see him show up, you start to discover the kind of God he is. It teaches you about his character as provider, as one who cares about your needs. And many of you can share in your own life different stories where that happened, where you made known a need or something and he showed up. And you look back at that as like, yeah, that's how I know who he is. I've lived that. I've walked that. He's shown up. He's good. He is faithful. There's a story I almost feel uncomfortable sharing it because I don't want it to be misunderstood, and yet I think it speaks to who God is, and that's why I'm going to share it. When I was do, uh, doing my undergrad, I, I needed a car. I was serving uh, as a youth leader. I needed to get around. Um, I had classes on two different sites, and I usually worked in the summers and then studied uh, and served during the school year. And so I had some money saved up, and I was looking around for a new car, or a used car, but new for me, you know what I mean. I was sitting in a library at my university or college at the time, and I was looking at, uh, you know, back when people still used Craigslist. I was looking up cars, trying to find one. And I had this strange thing come to my mind as I was doing it. See, I should have actually been studying, but I was like, look, I was like, I need a car, I gotta figure this out. And so, all of a sudden, this prompt came to me. Why don't you pray for a car? And I was like, uh, okay. So I closed the browser, and I went and prayed. And I just said, Lord, you know why I need a car. 
Would you provide a car? Carla helped me get to these different places. And this prompting was strange enough for me that I shared it with um, a pastor friend of mine. And he's like, wow, that's really cool. Uh, you should talk to this guy who runs a cars ministry. He might have one. So it, he was also a youth leader, and so I went up to him and said, hey, man, uh, this strange thing happened, and my friend told me to come and talk to you. And uh, he's like, oh, actually, like, we're closing the cars ministry down, so um, I don't know if I have anything. Let me, uh, I'll get back to you. I was like, all right. A week later, he calls me, and he says, hey, uh, I have a car for you. I'm like, really? He's like, no, I'm just kidding. And I was like, what? And he's like, no, I, I have a car for you. I do. I was like, thank you. I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, he's like, yeah, you can come pick it up today. Come and get it. I'm like, he's like, it's not a great car, but it's a car. It'll get you from point A to point B. I'm like, sure, a car's a car. I'll come and take it. So, um, you know, it wasn't a fancy car. It was like a nine, 10 year old Hyundai Accent. It belonged to a courier. It had like crazy mileage on it. Um, it was champagne colored. So I, I called it Champagna. And, um, you know, I'm not sharing the story for you to think, hey, like Alex is teaching me to pray for a Ferrari or a Tesla or anything like that. Um, that the car is not actually the point. The point is who is God? I felt prompted to pray. I wasn't thinking of doing that myself. I was actually trying to figure it out myself. And I felt invited to ask him. And I was actually in a season at that time where I felt the Lord teaching me who he is, that he cared about my life, about my needs, about my interests, and I could bring them to him, and I could trust him, that he had resources I wasn't aware of, and that he wanted me to ask him, that if I, was, if I would trust him and follow him, if I was willing to depend on him, that I could receive more than just a car. I could actually receive the joy of discovering how good my heavenly father is. That he's a God who loves to show up for his kids. He is the gift. And Jesus gives us the gift. Connected to that is reason number two why Jesus would teach us to pray like this. Faith enables us to receive the gift. Jesus is interested in a people who are willing to take him at his word, to trust him. That's what faith is, trust. And he loves when his people trust him. When the Roman centurion tells Jesus that Jesus doesn't even have to come into his home, but just say the word where they are right there and his servant will be healed, we are told that when Jesus heard this, quote, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Jesus praised the faith of this centurion. And then he said, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. When his disciples asked him later on in a different event, why couldn't we drive out that evil spirit from someone? Jesus said, because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here and to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Later on in the, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says in Luke 18, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? See, faith is what Jesus is after, and we sometimes make it out to be big, but like he says in that story of the mustard seed, it doesn't have to be big. And what Jesus does here is says, ask. Ask. Don't be afraid to ask. Ask. Who will trust me? Who will hear what I have to say and respond? Faith is what he wants to cultivate and form in us. This trust, this relationship of trust. Faith is what enables us to enter into relationship with our Heavenly Father. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Anyone who comes in faith asking God for help is heard, even if their faith is incomplete. Even if you're like, man, I actually don't feel like I have a ton of faith that you show up, but I feel like I need to ask you. Even if that faith is incomplete, but it's progressing. Why do you think that there's so many people that you and I know who have 
don't know Jesus. They don't fully know him, but they've reached out to God in times of desperation and had him respond and provide. In many cases, he is leading them to pursue him and learn more about him. And if God answers those prayers, who are we to correct him? We might say, but they don't know your son yet, Lord. But Jesus says, my ultimate concern is that you have the gift of knowing and relating to God as a generous, gracious, gentle, and glorious Father. And so, at the end, the command, the invitation is to follow Jesus, to trust him. But even when we feel like our faith is lacking, like it's not fully complete, he's so gracious. Another question you might have and tension you might feel is, but what about those who ask and don't receive, even though they have really good motives? Probably each one of us in this room have prayers that were great motives, not answered, and we live in that tension. We're talking about those who pray for God to heal their cancer, to heal their children's cancer or illness or a friend to survive their car accident. The truth is we all live with unanswered prayers. We live with... Them. Some are far heavier than others, far more painful than others. Some of us are still waiting on those prayers. And so in light of that, how do we faithfully obey his command? We don't ignore those thoughts, for one. We don't try to suppress them and act like they're not there. No, we ask with open, not clenched hands. We ask with boldness, but we wait in humility. We remember that the one who we follow and worship is not unable to empathize with us in our struggles. He fully relates to us. That's what we celebrated in Christmas. That we have a God who became one of us and suffered like us. He knows what it is like to feel pain. We remember that Jesus himself is the ultimate example of having a prayer not answered. When, you might say, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus says, My Father, if it's possible, t- may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus' desire in this moment in the Garden is saying, Look, I don't want to go to the cross, Father. I don't want to be crucified and die. If there's any other way to fulfill your plan to rescue and restore creation, please do it. And yet he's able to pray this other part of the prayer. I still want your will to be done more than my own will. But there's, that, there's two different wills there. And he's voicing, if it's possible, Father, take this cup. And in the end, Jesus did die a horrible, excruciating death on the cross for us. And yet as we look at Jesus, we must remember the resurrection. His resurrection, because the resurrection gives us hope that God will ultimately give us what we need in this life and in the next. That he will vindicate his people, that he will bring justice and restoration to all of the world, that he will deal with evil. See, we have in Jesus an example of one who is boldly willing to pray, actually, if there's a different way to fulfill your plan, Father, do it. And yet God in his goodness doesn't abandon Jesus in the grave. He raises his son to new life. And every single person who puts their trust in Jesus has that same hope and confidence. That even though in this life there may be things that don't go fully answered, they don't go the way we want them to go, we have this ultimate hope that God the Father will raise us with Jesus. And we will be heirs of the kingdom that he is bringing. So what do we do in the in-between? One, I think, don't be afraid to ask God for the seemingly impossible. You could hear this today, this passage, this command from Jesus, be encouraged, but if you never ask him, if you never seek him, if you never knock on that door, you won't get it. The most important thing you could do in response to this message is to obey him. So are there any things in your life, 
that you really want that you have not brought to your heavenly Father. To restore your marriage, to save your sibling or your coworker, to bring an end to the war, to rescue someone out of addiction, to help you forgive, to help you trust him. To renew the church in Canada, in Vancouver, among us, James says to, his follow, to Jesus' followers, you don't have because you don't ask. 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 Seek. Knock. Let me tell you a few things you can be asking for for our community. We're praying for a, a leader for Alpha, an Alpha leader. We have a team who's ready to serve, to prepare meals, to meet in person, to help people explore questions of life and faith and spirituality, but we don't have a point person to lead it. And there are people who are part of our church who have been attending more regularly because they actually began to participate and, and attend Alpha. Because it provided room for people to explore their doubts, to ask questions, to feel safe. And so we're praying for that, that the Lord would provide someone because we want to be able to run it and start it in January. It's like, I, I've been asking for the Lord to provide that for since at least January of last, uh, of last year. Pray with me. There's other people who've been praying it too. An alpha leader. One of the things we want to do this year because we're actually scheduled and we need to do it is paint the exterior of this building. It's going to be a large cost. Somewhere around $15,000. You can pray for wisdom and that the Lord will provide a way for that to happen. Another thing that we're praying through that you can join us in praying about is this desire to renovate the foyer, to create a space that's larger and more hospitable and welcoming. If you were here on Christmas Eve, you know how cramped it felt. It was awesome, nice to have all those people there. It also felt a little tight. We want to expand it and open it up. And you know what? This has been, this isn't even really new. Those of you who have been here for a number of years know that this has been in our hearts for years. There was already plans drawn up for it more than 10 years ago. But we're praying that this would be the year that we're actually able to begin doing the work. You can pray that the Lord would lead and provide and for all that's needed for that. Th second thing I think we can do is we can ask God for wisdom to know what to ask for. Sometimes we're like, I have no idea what to pray for, Lord. Ask for wisdom. We need the wisdom of God in our lives for this year, for our relationships. James 1 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Some of us feel like we just don't have wisdom to know what we should be praying for. One of the clearest ways to grow in wisdom is to spend time in Scripture. January has 31 days in the month. The book of Proverbs has 31 chapters. This year, if you feel like you lack wisdom, you could start by reading one, proverb of the, one chapter from Proverbs a day. You'd finish it in a month. It's not hard to read, but it might change your life. You might actually leave this month feeling like, I actually do feel wiser. I feel like the Lord's actually been filling me with his wisdom as I've made time to hear from him. You can pray, Lord, fill me and help me to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Love joy, peace, patience. Some of you are like, Jesus, I need your patience in, in my relationships with others. Help me bear that fruit with this person. Help me be patient, loving, joyful in this situation. You can ask God to empower you to love him and love others each day. You can pray the Lord's Prayer these are things he loves to answer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus teaches us to pray that because those are the prayers the Father loves to answer. And third, and finally, you trust him with the outcome. Trust God with the outcome. Trust him with the timing. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Because as you delight yourself in the Lord, your desires will be transformed into yearnings that align with his kingdom and his will. Romans 8 tells us 
Look, we know that all things work for the good of those who love him. We can trust God with the outcome of our prayers, knowing we don't actually have control over them, but we can trust him with all of our asks, whether we get them exactly as we asked for, when we asked for, or not. We have this confidence that our Father in heaven will use all of our circumstances for our good, to form us into people who look like Jesus. And see, if you practice what he teaches us here over a lifespan, asking, seeking, knocking, you'll discover a heavenly father who has always been deeply committed to your well-being. You will discover the power to live out the Sermon on the Mount, and you will become the person you were created and redeemed to be. The life, the power, the transformation that you long for is actually found in depending on your heavenly father. And that's what trusting him is all about. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. Father in heaven, we come before you and we give you thanks for your son, Jesus. He makes you known to us. He reveals what you are like. He is your message to us, everything you would want to say in a person, in a way we can understand. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this instruction that he gives us, this command he gives us to be a people who depend on you, who look to you, who trust in you, who give you control over the outcome, but we still come with boldness. and We humbly wait on you. Help us to be a people who live like that, Today, tomorrow, this week, into this year, Lord. Help us to be a people who, when we face challenges and struggles and discouragement, we would actually come to you and say, Father, help me. Father, help them. Help us to take all of those anxious thoughts, the restlessness we feel, and actually turn those things into prayers that you hear and are able to respond to. We don't want to be a people who just figure it out on our own. And we've tried it, Lord, and we see that it leaves us wanting. It leaves us tired and restless and anxious and weary. We want to live the life you came to bring. So fill us with your spirit, Lord. Empower us so that we could experience the life you have for us, that we might be changed to be people who reflect your son, Jesus. And we pray, Lord, you'd comfort all of those who have brought prayers to you, requests to you, and haven't seen them answered. And some are still waiting, and some haven't been answered the way we wanted, Lord. We thank you that your son Jesus gives us that picture of one who trusts all the way to the end and ultimately experiences vindication. We put our trust in him, Lord. And we ask for your help. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.